and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avogad. This day, late 1898 and early 1899, a really fascinating dynamic is playing out as President McKinley tours the South to drum up support for a resolution to the Spanish-American War. McKinley is mostly trying to win over Southern lawmakers to support the Paris Treaty, and in return, he has to make a number of political and cultural appeals, including planting the seed for how the Civil War would be remembered. In many ways, this was a key moment in which new narratives about the war and the South's role were reframed. And that's kind of how we were tipped off to this story in an email from a listener, David. Um, David wrote what I would say is one of the best listener emails in a long time um, and sort of laid out this idea and this context and we're sort of picking it up and we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But David you know, write, wrote us and said kind of like you could see this moment as the first embrace of the so-called lost cause narrative, the idea that the South was fighting a virtuous war to preserve their rights and their dignity. And we've talked about that narrative on this show before, but I often feel like it's thought of as something that's really that emerged maybe a little later in the early 1900s. And I at least hadn't really seen this connection to the Spanish-American War that David points out. So Mm -hmm. let's get into the details of all that. McKinley, the Spanish-American War, the roots of the Lost Cause narrative. Super fascinating. Here, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hi, Jody. Hey there. So um, let's, let's go sort of thread by thread here. So first, Spanish-American War, then the resolution and what McKinley has to do with Southern uh, Southern lawmakers, and then that sort of how this maybe plants the seeds for this lost cause idea, which, as I said, you know, David lays out, might be a sort of theory that he has or sort of a read he has, but, you know, we'll, we'll get there. But first, the Spanish-American War, you know, I'll cop for the first time in um, of many times, I think, this episode to not really having seen this before, but the Spanish-American War is the first time since the Civil War that Northerners and Southerners have to fight side by side. And that is a huge, yeah. huge deal. Yeah, yeah, it is really a big deal. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's also a war in which people who fought for the Confederacy are still alive, right? Like, or mm-hmm. largely still alive. You know, if you were in your 20s, you might be in your 50s or 60s. But for the most part, the the idea of the Civil War as being something that's still very present in people's lives um, is very real in this moment. And so having another war in which the United States has to come together and fight for imperialism, basically. But like, it's a really big moment. Um, it's also a moment, too, where, you know, you have Buffalo soldiers, you have black soldiers that are fighting, you know, in, in these troops as well. I mean, it's it's a lot going on over Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Philippines um, and those territories and Spain really relinquishing its hold on Cuba, Cuba being so significant to slavery, Puerto Rico as well. Um, so there's a there's a lot on the table. And I think that it's important, you know, Kelly mentioned that it's an imperial war, that it is about nationalism and yeah. nationhood and pride and power and this is our area to lord control over. And the United States has been attacked with the attack on the USS Maine. And so there is this sense that that provides a common ground for a fight um, for folks who last fought against one another, the the Southern soldiers and rebellion against the United States. And so it, it provides um, an opportunity to fight under the same flag um, in this very jingoistic moment. But did mm-hmm. Southerners or Southern, especially Southern lawmakers, holdovers from the Confederate era, um, did they see it that way? Did they want to go to war for the U.S. as a, as a unified country at this point? It's a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yeah Kelly was mentioning, and, and you can talk more about this, Kelly, but, um, you know, you were mentioning that the relationship was like Cuba and Puerto Rico mm-hmm. because they were so defined through these shared histories of slavery. Like, white enslavers in the southern U.S. had wanted more control over Cuba mm-hmm. and Puerto Rico for a long time because they yeah. saw them as part of the future um, expansion of slavery, a way to bring mm-hmm. more enslaved people into the U.S. And so for some southern for some white Southerners, it was like, ugh, why couldn't we have done this like 50 years ago? Yeah. We've wanted to do this for a while. Yeah, Mississippi in particular. I mean, Mississippi has a had a strong relationship with Cuba. It was actually providing a lot of more more enslaved bodies to go to Cuba to sort of uh, fuel these economic 
and political relationships. And so, um, I mean, in some ways, like you see a lot of these engagements engagements that took place politically and economically during the Civil War sort of having their their moment again in um, in the Spanish American War yeah yeah um, so the war starts to resolve itself uh, that sounds too passive the war is, is resolved um, and there's the Treaty of mm-hmm. Paris in 1898 by December of 1898 which is really the moment we're talking about here President McKinley you know at least senses enough reluctance among southern political officials that he needs to do this tour of the south and he does like a 200 stop tour or something um talking to southern elected southern officials and you know the the most notable one is he goes to the atlanta jubilee on december 14th 1898 and gives this big speech but you know he clearly feels this need to have to bring the south along in order Mm -hmm. to gain political will for signing this treaty and bringing it close to to the war um what's his what's his political calculus at this point the more support that he can get in the south the more buy-in that he can get in the south the more um the more he can really accomplish politically and i think that the south really becomes this major player in the sense that it's still operating as this block in which he has to be able to get them on board in order to get um any of his sort of legislative things through, but like the South still has this um, way of thinking that has to be persuaded in order to get them on board. And it's a it's an uphill battle for McKinley because the Spanish American War started under Grover Cleveland, mm-hmm. who was a Democrat, and the South is solidly Democratic or is becoming solidly Democratic by the late eighteen nineties. McKinley is a Republican, and so there's already some hesitance there but he Mm -hmm. needs southern senators in order to um, advise and consent on the treaty if he doesn't get them on board he doesn't get his treaty you're used to hearing my voice on the world bringing you interviews from around the globe And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. And so this is kind of where, you know, this story really starts to accelerate and pull in all these other threads. But by all accounts, McKinley's rhetorical strategy and his political strategy is to still hearken back to the Civil War. And he starts to really talk explicitly about the legacy of the Confederacy and the legacy of the war in trying to make this appeal to Southerners. We'll talk about some of the specific concessions he makes, Mm -hmm. which I think have huge lasting impact. But rhetorically, what is your sense of what he says? I mean, is he really starting to just like reframe, oh, that war thing that happened, you know, a generation ago? Um, (laughs) How is is he um, approaching that? I mean, I think he's approaching the South with a lot of care because he knows that the things that matter to the South the most is this sense of legitimacy, is this sense of legacy and heroism and the idea that they want to be considered brave, courageous, moral. They don't want to be um, sort of like demarcated as as the losers, right? And so part of that heritage for them is having monuments and having burial sites and places that mark their contributions as being even laudable, you know, like when you start talking about how you think about memory and how you think about memorials, that's a way of preserving their ideas. And so I think McKinley is very good at sort of assuring them that that this is what he can do, that he can give them honor, if you will. Right. This idea that they weren't traitors, they were Mm -hmm. honorable American soldiers who fought bravely and fought well and deserved to be recognized as well, which is a rewriting of history, but it Mm -hmm. was something that um, white Southerners desperately wanted. They had been reconstructed back into the country. They had retaken power most places across the South, and now they wanted that 
kind of stain to be removed from their history. And for much of the late 19th century, like campaigns were held pointing to the Civil War, this idea of waving the bloody shirt and Mm -hmm. pointing back to the the fights and the losses of the Civil War that had defined so much, particularly of presidential politics. And McKinley is basically charting how how things are going to to move forward yeah. and offers a path forward for that and in real and tangible ways through monuments through cemeteries um that can and blocking out arlington yeah. i mean like the fact that arlington gets you know a place for confederate soldiers um it's astounding to me right it's astounding, especially when you're like wait do you remember what this war was about like that to me is is wild yeah it's also especially powerful because Arlington Cemetery is built on land from the Lee family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is kind of a reclaiming. And then the statues that are put up there are meant to commemorate the South. There are allegories of the South. Mm-hmm. There are all of these um, equivalent tombstones for Confederate soldiers. So the, mm-hmm. the tombstones will be the same size, except the Union ones, the U.S. soldiers had rounded tops and the Confederate soldiers had pointed tops. Um, there are statues to Confederate women. And so there is mm. this kind of celebration and in some ways almost exoneration of the South and a a return in a way of that land, if not to the Lee family, then to Robert E. Lee's cause. Yeah. 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 Um, And yeah, so just to highlight kind of what's happening here, right? It's McKinley is both doing a rhetorical strategy of appeasing um, and saying the right things when he's in front of Southerners. But then, yeah, he's really doing... um, you know, political horse trading, um, I would say, in order to get support for the Paris Treaty. And a lot of that political horse trading, as we've been describing, involves this much, much larger, more fraught and ongoing, and I think really setting this sort of legacy of um, the story we tell ourselves around the Confederacy and the Civil War. And I, one of the things that's striking to me about this story is it shows that, like, it has always been about monuments and it's always been mm-hmm. about graves and you know physical reminders as much as it is about stories and well, narratives. I would say yeah I would say it's always been about narratives yeah. right because the yeah. narrative the, mm-hmm. the monuments are symbolic of the narrative that you're trying to tell yeah. so if you can shape the narrative then it doesn't matter if you won or lost because yeah. the story is what you want it to be which is you're still a hero you're still courageous you're still um American or however you want to you know see yourself um and i think that that was one of the most important um and still is in a lot of ways one of the most important tenets of the confederacy is upholding these ideas of their values about what they fought for um Mm -hmm. so and you see kelly what do you what do you make then kelly of this you know this idea that's planted with us from in this email um of this being a key moment in which the lost cause narrative emerged. Because, I mean, to me, you know, I feel like, obviously this stuff happens over generations, but, you know, to me, I feel like when I've thought about and read about the lost cause narrative, I often place it maybe a little later, and I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. Thomas Dixon writes these plays, and we have birth the, the, the Birth of a Nation come out. And this just puts it slightly earlier and puts it in the context yeah. of this political horse trading that McKinley's doing. I mean, do you f- kind of feel like is this, this is is actually a moment in maybe which that lost cause narrative is sort of codified in, a, in an important oh, way? Oh, yeah, I agree. I'm like, this is a dissertation. <laughs> this, is another, this is another book. I mean, like, when we think about how we shift timelines... Uh, timelines are so political, but like I, I think there's a lot of credence, certainly, with this idea that, you know, there is a moment in which, perhaps, the seeds of of the lost cause are being planted, um, or constructed, if you will, with these monuments, and that you get sort of this full bloom moment, and then even again in the you know the 1940s and 50s, um, but I could absolutely give credence to this yeah i mean and i think part of that is because these people who fought for the confederacy are still very much alive and yeah. that this is their sort of last or moment to mark for themselves what they fought for and then their descendants keep it going so you know the in 1915 it's this is grandfather's story this is what our grandfather's dating yada yada and it's about preserving that um sort of ancestral legacy but you de- i can definitely see a sound argument 
that this has this has legs to it for sure. And it also has an important argument for American imperialism that you're having the yeah. reconsolidation of kind of martial white supremacy mm-hmm. in the Spanish American War as the US is beginning to take extra continental territories in places like the Philippines and uh, as a protectorate in Cuba for a while in Puerto Rico, um, that there is kind of this consolidation around white supremacy again, which is going to fuel Mm -hmm. a lot of this empire, um, and to kind of rewrite the story of the Civil War makes that a more continuous story in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think you get a lot of support because, you know, it's still the suppression of brown people or people of color. And Mm -hmm. so Peekable um, can rally, unfortunately, rally around that as as another moment in which um, there's something that they can control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing this sort of reframing helps me get my head around is just, you know, I think the lost cause narrative, it's easy to say like, well, that was something that was born out of the Southern imagination. It was something that Southerners were invested in. And it's a story the South told about itself that then mm. spread and sort of gained traction. And I think this shows that in, in as many ways, it was the North and North, mm. you know, Northerners made choices to sort of be midwives for that theory and that idea and um and i think this is clear like what mckinley's doing is making a calculus that then creates oxygen for this this to emerge and i don't i don't think anyone could have anticipated perhaps maybe least of all mckinley that like that these statues or that these uh this iconography would would have this kind of power i Hmm. think that they probably thought well, this is minor. Sure, you want a plaque really? here? Sure, take a plaque, right? But you like, don't think you know? carving out space at Arlington Cemetery meant wow. something then in the way that we know that it means something now? I don't think they thought it would be as, as I don't think they thought it was as big as a concession yeah. as we see it hmm. now. Yeah. Um, I think if maybe if you had asked people closer to the moment of the Civil War, Especially for among, you know, Union soldiers who are still alive. They're like, what? Why are we doing this? But um, the more distance you get, the less resistance I think you get about certain yeah, yeah. Um, things. Right. Yeah. Until you get to, you know, 2020, right? When all this stuff <laughs> comes back. And I mean, again, I think it helps reframe yeah. sort of some of the things we saw there that like these statues matter and they came about for a specific reason and they need to be you know talked about, you know, in a specific way and in a sort of concerted way. And um Obviously, that there are still there's still a section of Arlington devoted to Confederate um, graves, and that statue that we described still stands. The valiant Southern woman and the brave Southern men willing to go off to war. Um, though an independent commission has recommended the removal of that memorial at Arlington, and we'll and, and we'll see. Mm. Um, but mm. clearly, this connects. And I also the, think it completes, and maybe this is redrawing uh, timelines too, but sort of completes Plessy versus Ferguson. Like when you think about 1896 and this mm-hmm. separate but equal Supreme Court case, that really codifies a lot of the laws that get generated in the South. This is sort of the cherry on top for all of that um, in terms of thinking about white supremacy socially legally politically economically so forth Hmm. yeah intellectually um all right well that brings us to the end of the episode super fascinating and david who wrote in you heard it from kelly this could be a dissertation so i don't know what stage you're at in your life i don't know what else you got going on but if you want to tell us where you are go down that path you know if you got nothing to do for the next what six to eight years of your life and you want to get a phd built around this idea go for it you know that's not yeah just just don't come to us for the uh to help with the student debt. Uh, <laughs> um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Our transcripts, which you can find on our website, are done by Kala Nakua. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Audrey Mardovich, executive producer, Yuri Lasordo, director of operations. Thanks to all of you who support this show by being members of Radiotopia. Find transcripts, sign up for our newsletter, find us on social, suggest topics, all that and more at our website, thisdaypod.com. See you soon.